Hey guys, I'm here today with my amazing co-stars, Perry and Stu. And we invite you to take a look at this awesome conversation. And if you like what you see, come down and see us online <laughs> in Slow Food. What attracted me to this project is actually I was wrangled in. I saw this project and I thought, wow, that looks amazing. I've never worked at that theater. And then I thought, I don't know how that is going to work. I don't know how they're going to do that and stream that. And so I, I just kept looking. And then it was because of the casting director, Michael Donovan, who actually brought me in. And um, I guess I needed a, a little bit of convincing that I could actually do the technical aspects of what this role demanded. Well, I, I was really attracted to this play um, by, from the character, actually. The characters and the character situation, it's a, it's a bunch of uh, three people that, have, that are put in a very, uh, a, a, a situation that we recognize just going to a restaurant, but particularly as the waiter, um, this particular waiter is very passionate, shall we say, about his work. Um, and that conflict in uh, the turning the service relationship sort of on its head was really, really funny. I remember reading the sides for the audition and thinking, this is hilarious. There's like a laugh a minute, like, like old Neil Simon scripts that I remember seeing, um, or really, really good sitcom scripts where there's a laugh every you know, 15 seconds. And I thought, if, if I can make this work, this seems like a feast of a character to live in for a while. Um, so that's what I, that's what attracted me to this project. Wow. What attracted me to this play was I wasn't actually planning to do this play at first, <laughs> being honest. Um, I was actually, we were pinned for well, we were on hold. They wanted to know availability for Young and the Restless. One of the days conflicted, so with a rehearsal. And um, I chose, but theater's always been my first love. When I read it, I'm like you, Perry. Um, I was laughing out loud the whole time. I'm like, oh my God, this writing is, is, is brilliant. Because the jokes are written, as we all know. Um, getting these lines down creates the rhythm and the flow and the sing-song feel of the, of the play. So what attracted me to the play and even to Peter was um uh, was the laughter and the joy that it made me feel when um I read it and of course beer so the start of the play it begins with um I will reluctantly say middle-aged couple um <laughs> the first time I was called middle-aged I fell off my bar stool but we are a middle-aged couple who has flown across country to celebrate our anniversary now imagine this we are hangry we are we are hungry we are jet lagged we have left new york we are now in palm springs with the time difference we have after trying three restaurants we have we found the last place open in town and we just uh my husband is as he mentioned my husband peter needs a beer i need to get some food in my body um and we just it we happen to get the slowest uh, the slowest waiter on the planet who is just um, bound and determined to have the night go his way. <laughs> and we and the two of us are bound and determined to have the night go our way. And then obviously that's where the conflict and the comedy ensue. The character I play is uh, the waiter, Stephen. Stephen with a PH. <laughs> which he's very careful to point out. He's a very specific, particular, uh, fastidious, specific, I can't stress that enough. He, I think he's almost a little ADD. He, he only wants things to go a very specific way. Um, and his idea of service is somewhere between Downton Abbey and uh, Flo and Alice on <laughs> that old TV series. Um, it, and I, and I think it's important to bring in that he, he arrives at the beginning of the play at the end of his day, at the end of a week, 
the, the restaurant is about to close for a day for their one, one day a week. So I think he might be a little tired and pressing a little too hard to make sure that he's offering his best to this very lovely couple um, that to his impression may or may not be attracted to him. Um, <laughs> lots, of, lots of madness ensues uh, as, we, as we journey through this evening. For me, my character, um, Peter, um, he is um, most definitely an alpha um, male, um, philosophy major, um, attended law school. Um, he's very bottom line oriented, um, matter of fact, turned business consultant, which is kind of parallel to myself because I actually was a finance major or who was a stockbroker who left corporate America to, to live out this passion of being an actor. How sane and rational can that be, right? But I don't regret it one bit. Um, so I kind of relate to that always, his philosophy side of always thinking and thinking about um, how things can be, but when it comes to getting things done and being action oriented, that's kind of what he's been trained to do. So I can most definitely can relate to that. He, um, he is a provider, he is a protector and he pronounces and he cares about his family. He's loved this woman, Irene. They've been together for what, 22, 23 years, you know, of marriage. I guess the 30 that everyone talks about must be, they, maybe they were together seven years prior, you know, cause that's what's, um, and all the, um, advertising they say we've been together for 30 years but maybe that's before the marriage but um i, I think what you get from him is that um he feels uh he's human he, he's he's funny that's the farce of the extremeness but what's really beautiful i think is the the way that he can um show that that um that alpha male tug of war thing going on as well as uh, uh being aware and not ashamed to show that you know he, he's he's a sensitive man as well. And I think that's important as far as being, you know, any man, period. Being comfortable in your skin, being your, your masculine, as well as your connecting with your wife. Let's bring it down. Let's be a little soft here so we can, um, so um, love can save the day. So that's Peter Dubois. I gave him the last name, which is a little, you know, for me. From New Orleans, um, moves up north. There you go. That kind of thing. Irene. Well... <laughs> Irene, I think, is shares similarities to um, a lot of women that um, hit middle age and have empty nest, and they just they're figuring out where their place is in the world. And then part of this journey in this this long evening is for Irene to fill her, figure out not only where her place is in the world, but where where she fits in the world with her husband. Um, because suddenly she doesn't have to care for her children um, in the same way. Is she, does her husband still find her attractive anymore? Um, it's, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know a lot of women that haven't gone through this at this point in their life, whether they're a mother um, or a wife or not, where you start to, Irene says at some point, middle-aged women are invisible. And I've, I've had friends said that same thing. So there's as, as much as there's there's comedy here, it, there it's really touching on how society treats women of a certain age when they're no longer um, what maybe is considered traditionally beautiful and they're no longer fertile. And it's funny that we talk, our characters talk about that. Well, maybe we could have another baby. You know, we don't we don't know who to be. Um, as parents, and then we discover through this course of thanks to this long, slow food journey, we we discover that we all of those things that we fell in love with each other for are still there, and it's about kind of reconnecting to ourselves as individ as individuals, not as just parents. So, um, and like Stu and Perry, the dialogue is just so. Great. So when I got the audition, that's when I was really sold on it. So I'd seen it. But once I read the script, I was like, okay, you got me. I, I want this. This is a role I want to play. This is uh, such good material. Um, yeah. So she's, um, I love, I always, I love playing women that are a little bit on the verge of, they're on the verge of something. And, and Irene is on a, ver, on the, she's on the verge of a meltdown if she doesn't get some food. And that's always, <laughs> it's always fun for me to play. 
What I find fascinating about Wendy McLeod's play is uh, so many so many comedies are built on dysfunctional marriages and dysfunctional relationships, and there's something really functional about this married couple at the center of this play. I, I find it fascinating that there's so much comedy to mine in ob just observing and hammering out in a healthy way, I think pretty much mostly, in this couple that has a marriage that is really working and just gets stronger from this crazy experience of being with a, a very stressful situation with a waiter. It's fascinating. And I, I think kind of brilliant and really relatable. I think this play is a fascinating character study because the playwright has created three very distinct personalities and she has confined them to a small space and she has moments where each and every one of them is out of control, like doesn't have control. And each, each character really desires that control, whether it's controlling the food or the beer or your husband's behavior or your wife's behavior. Um, and then all of the things that are out of control. So I think that interesting enough with where we are right now in this pandemic, where so many things we had to kind of go with there were so many things that we couldn't fix change and control over the last year that were absolutely out of our control and so in a strange way this parallels we are stuck in this space we can't we we, we don't want to leave because we're so hungry and so we're going to have to find a way to make to make this work and um we go through tactic after tactic to get our needs met and that's just juicy for an actor to figure out, well, why am I doing this? And why am I saying this? And why do I want this now? And we, we run the gamut on this marriage. And we talk about infidelity. We talk about, you know, um, wanting, you know, do you wish you had another, do you wish you had had a girl? You, uh, so there's so many in, in this comedy, there's so many things to mine about how humans behave under uh, under certain circumstances. Yeah, I will add to that and say I agree with you, Meredith, so much that this um, this the why this is a great character research um, character study for these people is these characters these roles is because it shows their humanity. Each one's specific, um, you know, it, it, um, way of being human, way that we are out of control way that we um, respond when we're loved, the way that we, re we, we react when we don't have food or when we don't have something that we may need a, a little shot of alcohol. So it displays full on um, the, the vulnerability, the realness of these, of these characters. The other backbone that I find fascinating that all three of the characters seem to be wrestling with is the notion and observation that they're aging and what that means. That means sort of a loss of control. Does it mean a loss of lucidity? Does it mean a loss of sexuality? There's this, there's this bone and bone of contention and conflict uh, that comes up over and over and over again about, am I getting too old? Or should I, did I not make choices when I was younger to help me be better now that I'm older? Or had I chosen a different career path or, as I retire, as I, it's, it's, it's a constant reflection among the characters. And like Stu says, I think reflects their absolute humanity. I mean, it's a funny, funny play, but I think because of these things of hum humanity and sexuality and doubts about money and security and things that we can and can't control, that's where this human aspect comes that makes it so identifiable. And I think that's why I find it so funny because there are things, every beat, there's another, there's another action or instance that happens where I'm like, that's exactly how I feel. I wish I could, I wish I could scream that out loud. And he, the, the characters often do scream those observations that I often feel and don't express. 
and they scream them at the top of their lungs. And it's very satisfying. <laughs> the, the thing that was daunting about creating this unique online version uh, of this play, Slow Food, for me, was the online aspect of it. Um, I am a theater animal. I've, I've, I've been working and performing on stage around the world for 30 years this year, professionally. So I was not prepared. <laughs> I mean, I, I have been working and living in Los Angeles for a little bit more than a decade. So I'm certainly comfortable being on camera, but this was, this is a totally different animal. This wasn't just being on camera. It was collaborating with our, our great props designer and our costume designer and our great, our film editor and our terrific director, Myra Mazur. That was all support, but we still shot it in our own homes in front of, with our own equipment, with our own lights and uh, having to upload the files. And it was, it, it gave me a real healthy respect for all the pieces in the puzzle of what other people do in contributing to make me look good as an actor because I thought I understood and this gave me many, many layers deep of understanding of how hard it was. I, have, I can't remember when I've worked so hard. These were, these were like, <laughs> the, the, the shooting day was only five hours, but to get ready with the props and have them set and the costumes ready and the makeup, hours before and then hours afterwards, downloading, uploading files to a Dropbox file, a Dropbox uh, file so it could all be uh, edited. It was, it was a lot, it, rewarding, but it was a lot. And trying to relate to my fellow actors online with, with the time delay because of how the Wi-Fi is working that minute or how Zoom is operating on my computer. It was constantly surprising, constantly challenging, ultimately rewarding, but oh my God, it was hard work. <laughs> How did you guys feel? Oh, well, I, I'm with Perry on the challenges, they, the challenges that were presented by doing this production via Zoom were not little. They were, they, I mean, I think there was a time when all three of us felt that it was probably insurmountable. I mean, it was, this has been one of the most challenging experiences of my career um, because, you know, to echo what Perry said, we, we were hair, makeup, pro you know, we were responsible for our props and responsible for our wardrobe and, and the continuity and the, you know, short, we have, we have a director, we had great director. We have, they, we're going to, I'm going to praise our editor. I'm sure for the rest of my life, because he's had his work cut out for, him. but it was, it was a challenge to, to combine all those elements as I you know, imagine, you know, talking to your fellow actor via zoom, but having earpiece in so that you can hear them and, but then acting to your own camera and never, ever having met, like we've never met each other, the three of us, we have never met each other. And yet we just, you know, we just played, I just played husband, husband and wife with someone. We just played, we just did this intimacy. And I think, and yes. So second to the tech was the, the comedic challenge. Um, trying to get those rhythms and that momentum going when, when we're dealing with the delays and, um, but we sure, we sure have been in the trenches together and the, uh, the three of us, and we have not even met. <laughs> yes. I will add on to that. Um, <laughs> wow. This was challenging. This was hard. But you guys are amazing because we were determined to make this happen. I have never worked so hard in my life before either. Getting up, running lines, brain being fried, you know, the delays, the technical delays, being a part of each department, wardrobe, makeup, hair, um, being the, the film, um, the, the, the video guy, the, the, the cameraman. But like you said, Perry, it makes you respect fully and honor those people that when we work on sets and the hard work that they do, 
to easily say thank you. I mean, we I'm, and I know that the type of people that you two are, I know you do. I do as well. But it really makes me say thank you. Thank you very much for what you do, because we had to all do it. Um, wow. Um, Maria, amazing focus, um, you know, laser focus, honoring the text. Ooh, because the jokes are written there was challenging at times when your brain is fried and you're tired at the end of the night. But hey, you know, we made it happen. <laughs> My first time doing this, not having having to connect virtually and not having that. In, I'm an energy person. So to have that in, not have that energy across from me or to be able to react naturally to something, you know, was 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 challenging. But we did it. Um, so this was like theater as you said, being shot like a sitcom. And we did it. So th I'm so glad that I got to do this wonderful journey with you two, for real. The last aspect I wanna bring in that was, that was truly absent and I mourn the loss of, as grateful as I am for all the collaboration that we had online and the relationships that we mined together and discovered the piece, what I long for is to present it to a real audience, a live audience that I can hear and react and respond. I, I didn't realize how much I missed it, but in a comedy like this in particular, there's that, that other collaborator that we're, that we're never gonna hear, that collaborator of the audience responding, telling us and affirming us that, that they're, they're with us and identifying us. And, that's nothing, there's nothing we can do about that. That's the, the problem of, of doing live theater in COVID online. But wow, what a challenge, what a challenge. You know, Perry there, it almost made me uh, long for um, the old sitcom laugh track. <laughs> so just to remind people that it's okay to laugh because yeah, you're right. There's, there's nothing like, all putting in all that work and then feel knowing that the audience has responded to it, that the jokes work or, and not even when it's not, not, not necessarily when it's a comedy, when you, when the audience is there in the palm of your hand emotionally with, with what you're giving them on stage. So yeah, that's, um, I look forward to getting back to that. Um, but again, so lucky to, you know, have had this experience. So I'll be talking about it for a few for years to come, right? <laughs> we we <laughs> we did it. The reason this play is the perfect play to get people laughing right now, I think Meredith already already announced. She already named it, which is this is a perfect situation about feeling out of control in a situ in a situation where you desperately want to connect with other people. And I can't think of a better way to describe this last 13, 14 months of being stuck in a situation where you would love to connect with other people and it's not possible. I, I have found myself in this time of pandemic and isolation that I've, I've found myself watching the entire seasons of, of Golden Girls, revisiting Mr. Ed, like I've been, I've been watching all of uh, Abbott and Costello, anything that will make me laugh, that will get me out, get me connected to my joyful self, because life just feels so out of control right now. It just feels kind of down. Not so much. I've, I've you know, we're, we're on the horizon of things, uh, opening up now and things changing, but man, I, I had a pretty, pretty dark winter to misquote Shakespeare. The, th this has been hard and I've been longing to laugh and to live with a play like this, with these characters and this script, Stu said it best. I laughed, I just started laughing with the audition and I haven't stopped. I mean, every time we worked on the, the scene work, it, it still, it still made me laugh every time. It didn't matter how many times I heard the lines, they were still hilarious. Um, and what I need more, what I recognize that I need more than anything else is laughter right now for me. And that's, 
that's what this play does. What I would like the audience to get out of this play is the, the reverence and joy for the seemingly mundane. What you take, what let's say an hour and a half of these two people's life, a slice of their life. And um, that's about maybe just food and beer and, and it becomes so much more than that. So I think, and just not to continue to hit home this, what we've been going through, but it's hard not to. I think that there's a, there's a simplicity that we've all discovered, been forced to discover in the pandemic. And that's kind of what, when you strip down the relationship um, between Arlene and Peter, it's just that let's, they, they've stripped away everything. His job is, they're not talking about his job on this visit. They're not talking about the, you know, they're trying not to talk about the boys. They're, they're got back to just he and she connecting. Um, and I love, uh, there's a moment where, you know, where my character just begs Peter to get off his phone. And that is so, so relatable. And I think that uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about, you know, maybe we got what we needed in this, this break. Not, not saying for the theater world, because I am all for theater thriving and I cannot wait to get back out there and, and um, to support theater and to be on the stage. But um, there's a simplicity to it, it, it's interesting. It's kind of, it's, it's weird to say, it sounds like a total dichotomy for me to say this kind of, this comical farce, there's a simplicity to it, but there is a simplicity to it. It's, it's, it's a looking at a marriage, a seemingly ordinary marriage, right? And um, under sitcom circumstances and, but what, what these two discover, and I dare say what the, um, what our waiter discovers about himself was I have a, I have a whole life imagined for the relationship that our characters have with the waiter after this night is over. Like I, I don't stop there. Like I, I think that we, you know, <laughs> that we went through enough that we're in each other's lives for good. And um, so I think it's the simplicity of human connection. Uh, I've never said out loud in a play it was such a raw thing for a, a, a woman to say. I used to write stand-up jokes about it, about women of a certain age becoming somewhat invisible. I, but I'd never in a comedy heard a woman say, middle-aged women are invisible and gone, yeah. And I always say that comedy is like, you know, it's like strumming, you strum your hands across the wounds and we're str kind of strumming our hands across the wounds. Our waiter is wounded. <laughs> we are wounded as couples, uh, but we get through. We find, you know, laughs in the ordinary. We laugh through the tears. And um, at the end of the day, we get what we really need, which is nourishment. For me, I would like for people to leave the theater, um, leaving after seeing this play, the virtual theater, just leave appreciating their lives, where they are at this moment. Find no matter how crazy and wacky and out of control or insane it can feel at times, find the joy. And, and, and find the, as we say, I'm Buddhist, we say, turn the poison into medicine. I'm from the South, turn the lemons into lemonade. Find the goodness in whatever um, craziness exists as in this past year with COVID. 19 being locked down, the industry being locked down for months. Um, a lot of the social injustices that are popping up and makes it very heavy sometimes, you know, with all the young black men that, that are being brown, black, yellow men that are being shot. Find, and that's so hard to find um, a light in situations like that. But there is, there aren't accidents. I don't believe in coincidences or accidents. Everything happens for a reason. So be able to appreciate our lives our lives where they are and be able to find joy in any situation that um that we attract into our space so leave with joy and happiness and peace somewhere for me i what would the audience what would i like the audience to get i think the best theater presents recognizable human behavior 
so people can actually see themselves or pieces of themselves on stage to identify. And that's where I hope the laughter and the joy and the pain, um, the mourning comes from. Because I, I feel particularly with this beautiful little comedy, every single person, well, all of us have at some point gone to a restaurant and had, wish we had a different kind of service. And that's the, that's the starting point of the play. And it just goes from there. And I think it's door upon door upon door of self reflection and refraction. And what I hope is that we can all see that commonality. That's not to get sort of big thoughts about it, but part of the reason that I stick with being an actor and even became one in the first place, the first place is because I like telling stories and I like being part of stories that relate the human experience so we can all feel closer together. That's, that's why I do what we do because I'm still a lonely little boy at 53 and I, I, I want to connect. I want to connect with the audience. I want to connect with the other characters. I want to connect with, with people. That's the, that's the whole point. And that's what I hope the audience gets to. The Southern California community should definitely watch it. I'm hoping that we can, that it's, it's not just the Southern California community that's able to watch it. I, I would, I'm really looking forward to uh, letting other people who, who um, haven't seen me on stage in a number of years get to experience this. But I think if we step away from the obvious, like the obvious that we, we like, you don't, you don't have to leave the safety of your home. It's a very inexpensive night of theater. We step away from all of that and just, and, and look at a little more practical. It's a wonderful opportunity to support the arts, which have taken obviously a very big hit over the last year. So yes, you're going to laugh. Yes, it's going to be affordable because your whole household can watch it together. Yes, it's going to be safe and you don't have to pay for parking and get on the 405 and all those things. And it's going to be a wonderful night of theater. But aside from that, I do hope that people in Southern California and anywhere that they're able to stream, remember how important it is to support theaters like this so that when it's said and done, they still are here. They're still here to keep us, um, to keep us enlightened and, and thinking and laughing and, and, um, and mirroring, you know, our own lives. So for me, that would be my, uh, my hope is that we can share it really far and wide with, with theater lovers. And, um, uh, hopefully, you know, there's an opportunity not only to watch, but you can, you can gift uh, you can gift the play to a, a senior or a student, um, and um, I have to tell you, I when I was a young actress studying, I was I w- I received one of those gift um, gifts you know gift subscriptions to the Mark Taper Forum in downtown LA because somebody decided to spend a little extra money so that a struggling student could go to the theater. Um, and that was one of, one of the best things, what, what an amazing thing in my college years when I was studying. So um, yeah, so there's lots of reasons to join us. So Cal and, and across, you hear that? My parents, they're, they're going to be, uh, I'm going to make sure they, they lock on. I haven't seen them in a year and a half. I think one of the reasons that the South, Southern California audiences in particular um, would want to see this play is that it's a, it's sort of about a Southern California experience. The whole play takes place in Palm Springs and talks about Palm Canyon Drive and the switchbacks up the canyon and, and how far away Joshua Tree is and what it's like to get stuck in with the wrong rental car. There are so many, there's so many, California specific humor jokes that you really get if you're familiar with Southern California and particularly the high desert. Um, yeah, the, that specificity, who doesn't like a, who doesn't like a play about themselves? 
And this is a play about Southern California. <laughs> that I think I'm um, Southern California and the world. That's what I was saying. I was saying the world should watch this because they're going to be, be able to identify with someone in this play is going to represent an aunt, an uncle, uh, a mother, a father, a husband or a wife. So they're going to be able to identify with um, these three wonderful um, characters, as well as, um, as Meredith said, it creates a, we support live theater. Theaters is back virtual. There's a new platform, a new stream of income for these, for um, I, ICT and all these other theaters who, I never would have thought of this, <laughs> you know, but it creates a, a stream of income for them. So that's even a more, you know, realistic, practical way of supporting. But um, so I agree that yes, Southern California, like you said, Perry, because of it being a local story, um, well, local Palm Springs, they'll get the jokes, they'll get the humor. And um, it's a wonderful way of keeping um, theater alive. I, I think theaters, theater, local theater is so important. Um, because, well, let me just, I, I am a big, I am a pro uh, arts education gal from, from way back, um, from basically my years. My, the study of drama has, and, and theater absolutely saved me from a lot of hard years, throwing myself into, into the art saved me from probably <laughs> a lot more destructive years. Um, and uh, right now, like, for example, I mentor, um, I mentor script writing with fifth graders, and I've done that for a number of years. And when you see firsthand how very important art is to young minds and um, having a creative outlet, how important it is. So uh, we, you know, it's our responsibility. I, I say, you know, it's our responsibility as people that came from the theater and that do theater to help to support keeping it alive. Because can you imagine um, if we, if the only acting we saw was on television, if the, if, if the only, um, that the loss of connection we would have, the, the loss of somewhat of reality that we would face when we don't see actually a human portraying a human live. Um, with reality TV and with all the streaming thing, um, it's easy to get caught up in the perfectness of, of what life seemingly looks like, but the, you know, theater is alive and it's not perfect. And, and um, the most glorious things that happen sometimes are those moments of, well, you don't know what's going to happen on stage. And um, so I think it's, um, it's just, it's just very important that we, we keep this, that this lives on. It has, and, and it will. And I think we have a little bit of a responsibility in, in, in giving of our time to make sure it does. Small professional theater like ICT, um, from a purely pragmatic economic point of view, are backbones of the towns that they're in. Long Beach depends on ICT and ICT depends on Long Beach. They're symbiotic because people plan an evening to go out to the theater or to the matinee, which involves uh, a valet to park the car, lunch somewhere, uh, uh, childcare, the, a little shopping that's being done all, all the, all along the way. It's, it, it involves a lot of, a whole economy is built around a theater and a theater becomes a community center in the same way that, uh, a, a church or these kinds of cultural institutions that are important to community. And if you're just gonna think with your pocketbook, you wanna support the theater because that gives people a reason to get out and, and spend money in your, uh, uh, at your business nearby. So that's why we want these theaters to survive. Yes, and I will add to that. Um... We want them to survive so they continue, so they can continue to, um, you say, educate you, Meredith, um, support the community, Perry, and I think affect people like me who were once corporate people that chose to take a leap of faith by seeing his first, you know, 
Broadway play, you know, later in my, my life, you know, compared to when other people saw it, Vanessa Williams and Kiss of the Spider Woman. I'm like, wow, how exciting. Because growing up in the South, you didn't think you could really make a living doing theater. You, you, my, your parents say, go to school, get a job, make some money. So you major in something that appears to be of stability, which was a, a finance degree. But then you come to realize that companies downsize as well, and they let people go. And that's actually what happened to me and my job. My company was, bank was bought out by another bank. They downsized, they gave us severance packages. So the universe pushes me out. It's like, what are you gonna do? Get another job in corporate America? Or are you gonna take that leap of faith and do what you were placed here to do? So, but I was affected by community theaters. So ICT and other community theaters and you know regional theaters and small theaters have got to stay alive. They are the backbone of our communities. So if you'd like to see Slow Food, you need to log on to ictlongbeach.org and go to their ticket tab and make a reservation. Get your, get your ticket to see Slow Food by Wendy McLeod, uh, directed by Myra Mazur and starring Meredith Thomas, Stu James, and me, Perry Ojeda. Uh, hope to see you soon. That's ictlongbeach.org. Let me talk a bit about the importance of a subscriber to the theater, not only for the theater, but for the subscriber themselves. Because when you, when you subscribe to a theater for their whole season, of course you're supporting the theater and you're getting a very good price for that as well. So you're saving money and you're also, most important, you, especially the kind of work that International City Theater does. Sometimes you've never heard of the play, you've never heard of the writer, you don't know what you're going to see. But if you've come to um, a theater company where you trust what they're going to do, it is going to be quality work. And some you'll like more than others, just like a painting. You know, you like this painting more than another in the art museum. Um, but you're opening yourself to new ideas and new experiences. And that's how we grow. And so, and then also that shared journey that you're taking with other people in the audience where that energy between the actor and the audience, because that's really the basics of theater is the actor and the audience, um, that feeds and, and um, makes a more enjoyable experience because we laugh together, we cry together, and then we learn and we grow together. And that's why subscribing to a theater is really important for individuals in your continued growth and education for all of us and also for a theater company because they have a base of support that's going to allow us to take risks and bring in new works or new experiences or relevant plays that we think are important to our growth and our dialogue in, for our society. We hope people will subscribe and um, help us continue to grow. Why should the community, the Southern California community attend International City Theater season? Because I hope you'll see that it's one, it's fun um, and it's educational. And those are really important things to me. Um, personally, I really strongly believe in education. Um, I've taught college for 25 plus years. Um, and it, 
it's really gives you a sense of community when you're at the theater and you're sharing an experience like this with others. And it, we can't do it without an audience. So um, we, and we certainly want to grow beyond what we're doing now. And that only happens with growing support. And so we hope that people will value and appreciate the, the kind of work we're doing and promise you it'll always be quality work. And it's an important investment in, in the community, in what we do, and in this art form. I am Karen Desai, the Artistic Director Producer of International City Theater. And if you'd like more information or to find out about our season of family, friends, fun, and food, or any of the productions, or any of our education programs, please go to our website at www.ictlongbeach.org. Thank you.